So thank you, Lord, once again for the evening. We're grateful. We are blessed. Thank you for allowing us to come together in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, and we're so blessed. So be with us tonight as we look at Psalm 33, and as you tarry, Psalm 34. But again, Lord, we just give you this night, and we thank you for all that you've already done and all that you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 33, rejoice in the Lord, all you righteous. And so that's speaking to us, all you righteous. So verse 1, rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. We are righteous, and that gets us to a position that we're remembering why we're righteous. It's because of the finished work of Jesus. And when we have that opportunity to meditate on that, well, naturally, we just begin to rejoice. When we think of the things that Jesus did for us, it's just our natural outbreak. We can't help it. And that's what, what's so great about it. So praise from the upright is beautiful. The Lord God receives the praises of his people. And so it's just a constant circle. We're reminded, we rejoice uh, the Father God loves it, and then it just keeps that circle going, right? And that's why we, we praise the Lord all day, no matter what our circumstances are. And there are certain things that we don't prefer, but we are rejoicing through that. Because our hope is not in this sin-filled world. Our hope is in the finished work of Christ and our entry into heaven. And so no matter what our circumstances are, we continue to rejoice, and the Lord receives that praise and it is beautiful. Verse 2, praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. And so we're seeing right here guitars, if you will. I mean, we understand what a harp is, but it's also, we can also recognize that as guitar music. And sometimes people don't agree with that, and that's okay. I'm just glad that we enjoy stringed instruments here in our worship. Amen? I mean, I don't, I'm not going to argue with anybody if they don't want to have guitars or drums in their church. That's fine. I'm just glad that we have them here. So what a joy. So we don't have to argue about it or worry about it. We just enjoy having that here. And so the, the instruments of ten strings. Verse 3, sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. So sing to him with a new song. As you come week after week, you notice that George, our worship leader, he mixes the sets up. We have brand new things, and we have things that, are, that stand the test of time. And so he mixes it very well, but being guided by God the Holy Spirit. And so we're singing the Lord a new song, but we don't neglect the old standards either. And, and standards, the, the, the glorious standards, stand the test of time. And so once in a while, George will give us the set, and we'll, we'll look it over and we'll go, wow, we haven't played this song for a long time. And we kinda, it's kind of nice because we put a new fresh face on it, if you will. We rearrange it just a touch. I mean, it's, you, you recognize the song, but we do a, a little tweaking. We kind of make it a new thing. But on the flip side, we're writing music, brand new stuff, I mean, that no one's ever heard. And things, and so we're always being led by God the Holy Spirit with a new song. We don't want to just, you know, drone the same old thing time after time after time. We want to have something fresh. We want to come to Him and sing to Him a new song. And so again, it's that mixture, the, the, the standards and something that's brand new, whether it's original, whether it's something that we've we've heard through uh, the internet or whatnot, or someone might shoot us a, an email, hey, just heard a new song today you guys might be interested in it, things like that we stay in touch so I'd sing to him a new song and secondly play skillfully play skillfully that is the requirement to have this this worship team is that each and every member has to be able to play skillfully and again we don't our biggest desire on this worship music team is not to be a distraction I don't care if we play, sit up here and play Mary Had a Little Lamb, but I want to play it well so we don't distract. As you're worshiping and as we see you worshiping, we don't want to do something dumb to pull you out of that time that you're praising the Lord. Those times when you stand up and you lift your hands up and you're 
face and your, your voice is unto the Lord, man, we just love it. When we see that, we are just breaking out in, in prayer in our own hearts and saying, man, Lord, touch these folks. Reveal yourself as you are. And man, we're with you. We're with you. And so it's a real balancing act trying to pay attention to playing the drum chop while I'm praising the Lord and watching and praying and George and everybody's, we're all trying to do numerous things and still play skillfully. So pray for us. You know? yeah, but it's a great thing to, to see people worshiping and that, that heartfelt praise unto God. It's just absolutely, it's, well, it's addictive. I mean, to see people worshiping the Lord and we are just right there with you. So play skillfully with a shout of joy. Verse 4. For the word of the Lord is, is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. So quickly reviewing, the word of the Lord is right. So that gives us great confidence, doesn't it? The word of the Lord is right, and his work is done in truth. Man, that, we have a solid rock to stand on. That's the Lord himself, and the earth is full of, good, full of the goodness of the Lord. Now, sometimes we have to search for the goodness of the Lord because this sin-filled world is full of a lot of nonsense, isn't it? So we've got to be on our guard not to be drugged down, not to think, oh, you know, it's all over. There's no hope. No, wait a minute. The goodness of the Lord is... is, is is filled, has filled the earth, and sometimes we might have to just look for it. And when we begin to look for it, we'll find it. And we'll find it fairly quickly. But there are times we have our emotions, we have our goods and our bads, our ups and our downs, but we've got to remember the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. So seek it out, and the minute you seek it out, you will find it. Okay? So that's what the psalmist is encouraging us to be reminded of that. Of that reality. Verse 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of Yahweh's mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Isn't that a neat thing to, to, to consider? The Lord just stores up the deep of the sea. He stores up the winds. He, he stores up the hail and the snow. I mean, that's something neat to think about. What a wonderful thing. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. You know, nature is often much more obedient unto the Lord than we are as human beings. And I'm not talking about this group here, but in general, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, the trees lift their branches unto praise unto the Lord. The earth shakes at the voice of the Lord, right? I mean, nature is so much more obedient sometimes than human beings. And so that's what we're, we're, we're seeing here. Hey, he spoke. He commanded, and it stood fast. Nature responded like, yes, you are the Lord. And so, Lord, help us be much more obedient to your presence. And, and we are. It's, it's an ongoing thing. We're always desiring uh, to, to be closer to the Lord. And, and it, it, it comes to pass, and it's a joy. Verse 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. Yet the counsel of the Lord stands forever, and the plans of his heart stand to all generations. Isn't that, that once again a comforting thought? The Lord's heart to all the generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Now truly, this is a, there's a double meaning here. By the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, David is certainly writing about God's chosen nation, Israel. But yet those 
who's the nation whose God is the Lord, can I put in there the United States? These are the people, I mean, God has blessed the United States. There's not another country like it. That's demonstrated by all the whole world wanting to come to the United States. And that brings its challenges and things, and that's not what I'm trying to, uh, you know, there's great things. I mean, marvelous things. It's, you know, Connie's and her, her heritage, I mean, Native Americans. And so we're, I'm really grateful that I can marry a Native American gal and she gives me passage to the United States and such. But, you know, we're all immigrants from one way or another. And it's a marvelous thing, but yet we have chosen to serve the Lord. And this was a country over 200 years ago that was founded on the goodness of the Lord. Whether we want to ignore that or lie about that or whatever, this country was founded on the goodness of the Lord. And I believe for that simple fact alone, it's my opinion, that's why the United States is the, the country that it is. And again, that's just my opinion, my observation. But the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Again, speaking about the nation of Israel, but can certainly be applied, I believe, to us sitting here tonight. Verse 13, the Lord looks from heaven. Now, of course, the Lord is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's not up you know, in heaven looking down. But this is just a, a, an understanding that we see the power of the Lord. He oversees everything. And so from a lofty position, heaven, the Lord looks, looks from heaven and he sees all the sons of men. And so the Lord is in a lofty position. Nothing gets by him whatsoever. Verse 14, from the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. God's design and desire, he would desire certain things out of, out of humankind. But the thing is, is, we recall and we understand we have a free will, don't we? He'll fashion, he desires certain things for us, just like our kids, we desire certain paths for them, but at a certain point, they're going to make their own choices. We hope they're good choices, and it's the Lord saying the same thing. Hey, I'm going to fashion your heart, but then I'm going to have to sit back and just consider your path, consider your works. And then I will reward you accordingly. And the reward we end up with may not be what we wanted or expected, but the Lord gave us that free will. And so he has certain desires, but he will consider our path. Say, okay, hey, I don't recommend that path, but okay, that's the way you want to go, that's fine. Verse 16, no king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. Neither a horse is in vain, and it's a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its strength. David is speaking here, if you depend on your strength, if you depend on your strong animal, if you depend on your own ways, you're going to fail. But if you lean not on your own understanding, acknowledge God in all of your ways, he will then direct your path. And then he may use the strength that he gave you. He may use the animal that he gave you. But if we solely think that, oh, it's because I'm so rough and tough or good looking or smart or whatever, and I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get through this, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. We cannot lean on our own understanding. We need to acknowledge the Lord. And again, these other things are wonderful, but they've got to be orchestrated by the Lord. And then we'll be successful according to God's will. Behold, verse 18, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in the famine. Once again, we're going to have our ups and downs, but our hope is in God's mercy. He will deliver us. He will walk us through the famine. I mean, none of us want to go through it 
But again, we've got to, it's a great reminder to remind us that we are living in a sin-filled world. This is not our home. We're passing through. And we have an allotted lifetime, an allotted lifespan. And we are going to have our ups and downs. But when we're going through not only the trials, but the blessings, we have got to remember our hope is in the Lord. As the Apostle Paul said, whether abased or whether I abound, I constantly praise the Lord. And that's where we desire to be. And we are. We're learning and we're being matured into that posture, and it's great. Finally, in, verse, in chapter 33, verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our, heart, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. And that's the bottom line, isn't it? We trust in God's holy name. And finally, Lord, let your mercy be upon us just as we hope in you. And we know that hope does not disappoint. As long as we have hope, we can face another day. And so what a, what a, what a psalm of hope here, a great reminder. Psalm 34, now briefly, as I just kind of unpackage this a little bit, in 1 Samuel 21, we get a chance to take a look at it, but 1 Samuel 21 describes and tells us that, that David, prior to him being coming king, David was running from King Saul. King Saul wanted to kill David because the kingdom, the nation of Israel, was taken away from King Saul, and it was confirmed to King Saul that David, his little servant boy, if you will, was going to be the next king, and Saul couldn't take that. He wanted to kill David. So David, now in, in 1 Samuel 21, and this, this psalm kind of, kind of uh, prepares us for this, but in 1 Samuel 21, David on the run from Saul finds himself amongst his enemies, Abimelech. David finds himself amongst his enemies. And David, as 1 Samuel 21 unfolds for us, David pretended to be mad, pretended to be out of his mind. Because David knew that some of the soldiers, some of Abimelech's soldiers were starting to think, wait a minute, I know this guy. This guy, David, hey, wait a minute, he is, and, and they started thinking, he is one of Saul's men. And so David thought, you know what, I'm going to get my head removed from my shoulders. And so David, after being counseled by the Lord, pretended like he was losing his, lost his mind. And so when Abimelech saw this and he heard the chatter, hey, this is David, one of, one of King Saul's soldiers, and of course David was on the run from Saul. But when Abimelech saw that David it appeared that he was losing his mind, Abimelech said, ah, oh, he's no problem, leave him alone. And so that's how the Lord, we're going to see here in Psalm 34, the Lord protected David in that scenario. Quite, quite an interesting uh, story in 1 Samuel 21. Give it a check next time you get a chance. So, the mat, so David demonstrating as if he was gone in, had gone insane. Verse 1. So David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, David says, and let us exalt his name together. Follow me, David is saying, as I follow Yahweh. Let me teach you how to praise Yahweh. Let me demonstrate to you through my life his goodness. Follow me as I follow Yahweh. And you'll be trained in that regard. Magnify the Lord with me. And that's what we come together as a body of Christ. 
Hebrews 10 tells us, hey, don't forsake the gathering of the, of the brethren. How many times do we hear people say, well, I don't go to the church anymore. I just turn on the internet or turn on the TV. Those are fine things as embellishments. I mean, what would we do with, without our radios in our cars, right? Or, or our, our uh, MP3s that we would you know, plug in and listen to a teaching. I mean, these are great. Audio, the electronics are wonderful. But it's an embellishment. And so David is saying, hey, magnify the Lord with me. So when we're by ourselves in the, in the bedroom, watching, watching our Sunday service or whatever, and again, if you're infirmed or something, that's not, you know, keep my comments in context. We, but when we can, we need to be together, magnifying the Lord together. As David is saying here, as the book of Hebrews is, is reminding us, come together so we can have fellowship, so we can hug one another, so we can shake hands, so we can have, have a time of fellowship together. And we, don't do, we can't do that electronically. And again, that's an embellishment which is wonderful. But the Lord wants us here to magnify him together. And that's what David is saying. Magnify the Lord with me and let us all together exalt his name. And that's what we're doing here tonight on Wednesday night. I sought the Lord and he heard me, David continues, and he delivered me from all my fears. And then speaking of David's friends that were with him, they looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, he's speaking about himself now, David is speaking about himself once again. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. So again, David is being this wonderful example to his men with him. They were not ashamed. They looked for the Lord, and their faces were radiant. And so David was a fine example. And that's what we desire to be, is examples of how to worship and how to exalt the Lord. And what a blessing. Verse 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. We had a guy in the fellowship here for a while. He had a taco stand, and that, that was hanging right over his, his grill uh, Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, come, taste and see. The Lord is good. And man, he had some good tacos. And then he moved to Orange County. I thought, oh man, rip off. <laughs> oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. But, but of course, we'll get together on, on August, the, what is it, the, the, the 5th. Yeah, amen, praise the Lord. We'll get together and taste and see the Lord is good. Uh, blessed is the man who trusts in him, David goes on to say. Verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord you his saints there is no want to those who fear him now the young lions lack and suffer hunger but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing now the young lion the only thing that young lion can depend on is his own strength and yet even his own strength will not every time save him and so we have that advantage. We have that ability to seek the Lord. And as we do, we shall not lack any good thing. Very comforting tonight, amen? Verse 11, come you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So in other words, so again, follow me as I follow Yahweh. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Well, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Secondly, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now, as we've been studying in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul, lately on the, the several Sunday mornings, we recognize that the Apostle Paul was a good student of David and the Psalms. The Apostle Paul was a good student of David and the Psalms. We see that evidenced as Paul writes in the book of Galatians, 
chapter 6, verse 9, Paul says, hey, let us not grow weary in doing good. Let us not grow weary. And then Paul continues as he speaks to the Romans. In Romans chapter 12, verse 18, Paul writes to us, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Try to keep things copacetic and casual. And at the, to the best of your ability, pursue that. And so once again, back in our psalm, David is writing, and, and this is what, what the Apostle Paul was studying, depart from evil, do good. And Paul got that. Do good. Don't grow weary in doing good, he embellishes. But he got that from David. Seek peace and pursue it. Truly, the apostle studying the writings of King David, hey man, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably. And so David, it, uh, excuse me, Paul is a student of David's writing. As a good Pharisee, as a good Hebrew boy, of course he would know these psalms. And so, again, this is coming out. Whatever goes in, transfers in, processes out of your life. And so we see that in Paul's life. Seeking to do good and seeking peace and encouraging us to do the same. And we receive that tonight. What a blessing. For the eyes of the Lord, verse 15, are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. But yet on the other hand, verse 16, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. What a, a sorry legacy. The Lord is saying, hey, for the evil man, I'll cut his legacy off. What a sorry legacy. Can you imagine that? What a sad scenario. Yet, Verse 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears. So kind of this back and forth, kind of like the, the Proverbs sometimes. When the righteous cry out, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. That's a pretty heavy thing to consider. Jesus, speaking in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, and we're all very familiar with it. Matthew 5, 4, Jesus speaking, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And studying that simple verse of Jesus, we understand that Jesus is saying, Blessed are those who mourn over their sin." Blessed are those who hate sin and they're looking in the mirror and just seeing, Lord, I can't do this. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And every time we do, we find ourselves in that position. We say, man, Lord, I have just fallen short. But we know that that whisper from the Holy Spirit says, yes, I will comfort you though. You're forgiven. And we know it's not a license, grace is not a license to go sin. We understand that. But it's those times when we're truly being convicted as we're in our devotionals or we're just meditating on something or whatnot, and we just say, Lord, oh, wretched man that I am. But thanks be to God for the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so we get that. And so as we mourn, we are comforted. And we find great blessing in that. And finally, as we begin to close, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So wherever you're at tonight personally, take heed. Many are the afflictions. And as we looked a little bit Sunday, are we living a life of ease or are we living a life that people are actually getting upset at us because we're Speak in the name of Jesus. Now, if we're living that life of ease and that kind of undercover, well, that's between you and the Lord. I mean, whatever. 
But many are the afflictions of the righteous. Does the world know you're righteous? The righteousness of Jesus Christ? We, I trust that they do. I, I'm sure that the world does know that. And that's going to bring trials and tribulations. There was a funny thing I, I noticed last night. We went to uh, uh, the high school last night for a graduation. Our daughter graduated and, and such. And in, as we were walking through the parking lot, there were the, senior, the seniors of the high school. They had their parking lots, and they had little signs, and they could put a little saying on their sign, and that was their personal parking spot for the year. And I was looking at a couple of them. Some of them were kind of funny, and some of them were just lame attempts at, at humor. And, but I did, I did see something, and I, don't, and I don't think it was a coincidence, but we had walked by one, and I saw it laying uh, off in the grass, and it was a scripture. And I started looking around, I, I, and I noticed that that was the only sign that was torn off its post. It was the scripture, and I, and I kind of, uh, you know, and I was just a guest there, and I didn't want to, you know, disrupt anything. But I thought, how interesting, Lord, that all the other corny signs are up, and this one that has scripture is knocked down. And, and I just felt like the Lord is saying, yeah, you know, this is, this is the world you live in. And I was kind of comforted by that. I said, that's okay. That's okay. So I, I thank you, Lord, for that student that 18-year-old student, 17-year-old, 18-year-old student that put that scripture on their sign, the boldness of that young person. And so it was just a little kind of a little one-on-one -on -one moment. I mean, I didn't even tell my wife next to my side, but I thought, how interesting. And that's the world we live in. And so good for that person that, that put that scripture on there. And, and Lord help, I don't think it was a coincidence, but Lord help, I mean, if it was an accident, praise the Lord. But if that was vandalized, Lord, we do pray for that, those vandals. So many are the afflictions, but he will deliver us out of them all. Verse 20, he guards all his bones, speaking of the righteous, and not one of them is broken. This is just a Hebrew poetic way of, of saying that, that God will protect us. So it doesn't mean if you've gotten a broken bone that you're not righteous. I can imagine turning on some crazy teaching someday and somebody will say you know if you've got, got, had a broken bone in your life you're not righteous it says it right here in Psalm 34 so we're going to clear that up right now this is just a poetic way of speaking that the Lord will protect you and that's as far as that goes <laughs> some of the funny things we hear on the uh, teaching on the radio or TV is just absolutely insane but nonetheless he guards his people verse 21 evil shall slay the wicked isn't that something people that pursue evil, that evil will slay that person. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? When you pursue evil, it will slay you. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate righteous, righteous hate the righteous shall be condemned. It's not over yet, brothers and sisters. It's not over yet. God has not Hold the trigger yet. The righteous, uh, those who hate right, the righteous shall be condemned. And finally, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants. Yeah. And none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. We win in the end. All right. If I could ask the worship team to come join me. Just wonderful opportunity to kind of sit with the Lord tonight. Just be reminded of his goodness because we need that, don't we? Because outside these doors, we get nothing but heckling and, and uh, discouragement, things like that. We get challenged, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why it's important. That's why God wants us to come in the flesh and embrace and to sit and to meditate and to have something just spring into your head, oh man, what a great piece of scripture. Oh man, I needed that. Or yeah, that's right, that's where I'm at. Or man, Lord, thank you for that reminder. And so what a blessing. And so what a great time tonight that we could just kind of sit with this psalm, these couple of psalms, and rejoice in the Lord. Amen? Jesus is our rock. He is our salvation. Won't you join us by standing? Let's go out praising the Lord, shall we?